Hey, my name is Pamela Coons. I'm a GI medical oncologist and I'm the vice chief of diversity, equity, and inclusion for this section of medical oncology. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Abba Black, who will be our speaker for today's Cancer Center Grand Rounds. And um, I had the um, pleasure to get to know Dr. Black in the course of our, um, she's also a vice chief um, for the section of general internal medicine for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have a wonderful committee that we've gotten to know each other through that effort. And, um, but just by way of background, I'd like to share with all of you um, about Dr. Black. So she is an assistant professor and associate program director for diversity and inclusion um, in the Department of Internal Medicine. She received her bachelor's from Princeton and went on to graduate from medical school at the University of Rochester. She completed her residency at the Yale Primary Care Internal Medicine Program, and she also served as chief resident. She currently works as a faculty member in the section of GIM. Many of Dr. Black's career and research interests focus on enhancing workplace diversity and inclusion, including participating in minority recruitment efforts, facilitating workshops on bias, um, of which I attended one that was fantastic, and researching the effects of race on minority physicians. Her clinical work is devoted to working with underserved patient populations in the primary care setting. And in her role as a clinician educator, she also works towards supporting residents who identify with minority affinity groups and developing curricula designed to enhance cross-cultural knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And um, I have truly been so impressed with Dr. Black's efforts through these um, workshops that she's really developed and spearheaded. And I really think that we can all learn a great deal. So Dr. Black, welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. That introduction was incredibly kind. I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to, to come and chat with the group. So thank you all so much for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Uh, so I have no disclosures today. And as far as the learning objectives for the next hour or so, um, I hope that we can touch upon three major points here. First, anytime I do a talk like this, you know, I hope that we begin to ex expand our scope in terms of what we understand to be unconscious bias and how it plays a role in our healthcare workforce. This is less a patient facing talk and more thinking about our own culture um, and our structure in terms of what it looks like for healthcare professionals. I also hope that some of what I share will enhance awareness of personal blind spots, of which we have many, myself very much included. Um, and lastly, thinking about some steps that we can take to promote equity, both in terms of our personal spheres of influence, but also thinking more broadly in terms of institutions and organizations. So I hope to leave you with some inspiration in that regard. I will say, uh, just to uh, put it out there in the beginning that, you know, of course, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a very large umbrella term, and there are many lived experience and identities that are important in terms of what that DEI uh, umbrella really looks like. Most of my work and initiatives have focused on race and ethnicity, so I just want to be clear about that at the onset, that a lot of examples in the literature I'll cite will be related to underrepresented groups in terms of race and ethnicity, but of course that's by no means a, um, an attempt to minimize the various forms of diversity that in fact really make up that important umbrella of DEI. So first I'll talk about some background and hopefully some interesting con contextualizing information for you all. Um, and then we'll go into some of the work that's been done around workplace experiences of those underrepresented in medicine. We'll chat a little bit about why this is something that's important for all of us, regardless of, of how we spend our time in academia. And lastly, um, we'll end as promised with thinking a little bit more broadly around steps to move forward um, and how we can actually take some of this work and, and make it more concrete. I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of these common DEI terms. I, I do just want to spend a few minutes going over some, some common terminology because I think it's important to develop a shared mental model um, and make sure that you all are clear about what I mean when I do use these terms uh, throughout the talk. So implicit bias, also known as unconscious bias. One definition that I like is thinking about this term as relatively unconscious and relatively automatic features of prejudice judgment and social behavior. So really that predisposition, that mindset, that's not intentional. That's not about you know thinking about any um, uh, antagonistic views or uh, uh, feelings towards any particular group, but nonetheless operate um, at a, a level that we're not fully aware of. 
And then thinking about microaggressions. So if implicit bias is the attitude or the, the predisposition, then microaggressions are really these uh, behavior-based manifestations of such. And it's actually a really old term. Uh, Chester Pierce, an African-American psychiatrist, dubbed the term way back in the 1970s, which I was surprised to learn about because I feel like it's a term that only more recently has come into academia as a more of a buzzword and something that people think about more often. And initially when he conceptualized the term, he really was only uh, thinking about it as applying to African-American physicians and trying to describe some of their, their experience this. However, since that time, we've really expanded microaggressions to be relevant to uh, a whole host of identity groups that may be marginalized or underrepresented. And this definition that I've written here, brief everyday exchanges that send in meaning messages to people because of their group affiliation, I think really encapsulates that concept that these, again, are not um, obvious in your face, um, hateful ways of, of behaving towards people, but they nonetheless can make people feel otherized outside of the mainstream, disrespected or demeaned, uh, even without that lack of, of conscious intent. Um, importantly, you know, when we both, when we think about implicit bias and then microaggressions as the outgrowth, what binds it all together is that these really are things that are unconscious, subtle, and, and automatic. And so oftentimes people have consciously held egalitarian views um, in regards to any kind of people group, right? They, and I think it, I would say that that's very much true of our culture here at Yale, that people see themselves as um, those who really embody ideals of, of justice, of equity for all people. Um, so this is, again, not about casting labels on anyone, talking about anyone who's explicitly racist or sexist, but nonetheless thinking about the ways in which those automatic connections that are happening inside each and every one of us, myself included, can, can end up causing a lot of harm. And so micro, the micro and micro aggressions is not about the impact. You know, I think it's really important to separate intent versus impact. People can have good intentions or neutral intentions, but nonetheless cause a lot of uh, harm and, and negative impact. So that's an important point to keep in mind as we, we go through some of this content here. In terms of the literature on unconscious bias, you know, a lot of what we know really comes from the social psychology literature. And a lot of the studies support that unconscious bias develops at a very early age. You know, as early as age five or seven, they've done experiments where they've asked children to rate the pain score of individuals who experience a painful stimulus, such as hitting one's head or uh, biting one's tongue, right? And, and they, what they find is that children will, for the very same stimulus, children will actually say that an African-American child experiences less pain compared to a white child. Um, that, of course, is highly significant knowing what we know about disparities in terms of uh, adequately treating pain across race ethnicity lines. Um, the second point here is about thinking that unconscious bias also has real world effects on behavior. So sometimes people think if this is happening underneath the skull and it's just all this uh, very abstract kind of processing, what does this actually mean? And I think it's important to note that there are some studies that show that in terms of, um, for example, a pro-white uh, implicit association, not explicit racism, but it's just an automatic kind of implicit bias that's happening that automatically favors white over black people, for example. If you take those healthcare providers who do have that pro-white bias as demonstrated on the implicit association test, those same providers will also have observable behavior such as decreased eye contact, um, engaging, small, engaging in small talk less often with their patients who are black or brown. So just important to highlight that the implicit associations can spill into the decisions that we're making, um, which is, of course, very important when we think about health equity from a broader standpoint. On a more hopeful note, there are some studies that do suggest that unconscious bias can be malleable, particularly if you spend a lot of time engaging with people around their bias. Um, and showing counter stereotypic images over a prolonged period, you can actually attenu attenuate to some degree the level of implicit bias folks have. Um, and one example of that was taking uh, studies that looked at taking college students who had um, an implicit association of women having less high powered careers. This is an implicit bias that I have myself um, around women and, and career. And over time, if you, if you um, expose those people to a number of different um, people who uh, challenge the implicit association, um, those same college students were found to actually improve their scores on the implicit association test. So a hopeful note in terms of what it, we can actually do about some of our implicit associations. 
I always like to point out, uh, particularly to a, a group of healthcare providers, that um, you know the things that make implicit bias worse are things that we have in spades in our profession, right? No matter what you do in, in healthcare more broadly, chances are you've experienced some elements of cognitive overload, sleep deprivation, and stress, right? So just kind of being extra aware that in our field, um, those sort of quick, fast brain implicit associations that are going on are much more likely to happen um, when we're not getting adequately adequate sleep, have high levels of stress, and constantly uh, have a lot to deal with cognitively. Some of you have made, may have seen this depiction before. I think it's important uh, to highlight because I think it really helps to demonstrate what the goal is when we talk about these larger goals and aspirations for diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And on the left upper side of your screen, you'll see inequality. And I think that's a pretty intuitive term for most people. The, the tree is obviously slanted towards the left, has a lot more fruit on the left and the right side. And so clearly that person on the right has unequal access. And I think that that's pretty clear. No, no one wants that. And then moving along uh, on the right upper side, now we have this uh, equality question mark. Um, and what that means is now you've evenly distributed tools and assistance as depicted here. Now both individuals have the same size and color ladder. Um, so presumably, you know, you might think that that was the goal. And for a long time in DEI work, we, we did talk a lot about equality and evenly distributing these tools and assistance. But as this graph does a nice job of, of showing, the tree is still planted towards the left and the apples are still uh, congregated on that left side. And so even though you've, give both, you've given both people the same size ladder, that person on the right still doesn't have that same access to, uh, uh, to opportunities. And then we move to the left bottom hand, F, which is the, the E in DEI. And this is the idea of customizing tools and assistance um, in order to address the existing inequality. So now, even though that tree is still planted, the person on the right has been given a taller ladder, so is in a better position to actually reap the fruit of the tree. Uh, but ultimately, and I think this is what we, we all hope for in the ideal world, what we really have is justice. And by now you've probably picked up on the fact that the tree in fact represents the systems and the structures of our organizations and our societies, right? And so now both people have the same size ladder and actually do for the first time have equal access and opportunity um, because the fruit has now been distributed towards um, throughout the tree and the, the tree is actually uh, upright. So thinking about what the larger vision I think is can be really important to center us around what our goals are for DEI work. Um, so some contextualizing data as promised, the term underrepresented medicine is probably not a, a new term for most people. And the way that the AAMC defines this is as those racial and ethnic populations that are underrepresented in the medical profession relative to their numbers in the general population. So for the purposes of terminology, what that really includes is Hispanic, Latinx, African American, American Indian, or Alaska Native origin, as, as is depicted uh, by the, the AAMC. I will say here, because I think this is important, that race is a social construct, right? The way that we decide to create boundaries around different people groups is more a reflection on society than it, it's necessarily around genetic similarity. Um, and of course, we can think of many races, for example, the Asian race that encompasses so many different kinds of cultures and people um, from multiple kinds of lineages. So the way that we uh, think about race to begin with is problematic. And so I just want to say that even though, you know, there's an effort here to just designate those who are underrepresented, it's not a perfect thing, right? There's a lot of heterogeneity even within one racial group that stems back to our, our society's way of trying to, to group people and homogenize them. Um, but I will use that term underrepresented because it, it is how we have tried to track um, how we're doing in terms of diversifying our, our workforce. Now on the left side of your screen coming up here, you'll see a pie chart that represents the racial ethnic breakdown of the US population. Um, and now you'll see a similar graph this time on the right um, that's depicting the racial ethnic breakdown of our physician workforce. And um, even though this data is a few years old, it, it actually hasn't changed significantly, unfortunately. So what I'll draw your attention to is that on the left, you'll see that Hispanic or Latinx individuals comprise approximately 18% uh, of our population. Um, but when it comes to the percentage of the physician workforce, they're only 5%. Similarly, for African American individuals, 13% of our population is only 4% of our um, of our, our of our workforce. 
We also note that as you think about the various aspects of the you know, academic trajectory that, that we all go through to, to become a physician, um, not only is there this drop off when, it, when we go from the overall population to practicing physicians, but those steps in the middle to go to medical school then to pursue residency or fellowship, um, we're, we're losing people along the way, right? And there's increased uh, attrition rates. Um, there was actually a paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine recently that was looking at the diversity of U.S. training programs from 2011 to 2019. Um, and in many cases, the numbers have stayed the same in terms of the representation of underrepresented individuals. Um, and in some specialties, in some of the surgical specialties, there was actually a drop off in that, in that period, um, which is disheartening considering that there's a lot more attention paid these days to the importance of diverse recruitment and retention. So something is happening uh, along um, the trajectory that I think is important for us to pay attention to. Um, and that brings us to this next topic around workplace experiences of those underrepresented in medicine. There are multiple studies, and a lot of this work has been done by Yale's own um, Marcel Nunez Smith, who many of you probably know in, in terms of her, her work, both locally and on the national stage in the pursuit of equity. Um, and a lot of this work has consistently showed that uh, physicians who are considered underrepresented in medicine have very adverse experiences in the healthcare workforce and cite things such as lower career satisfaction, patients refusing their care, feeling like there's racial bias in the academic environment, not feeling supported or adequately recognized, um, um, on, on and on and on. So what we were interested in, and we meaning a, a research team that was part of a few years ago, was thinking about how underrepresented medicine uh, residents experience their training, because there was certainly some research to help us understand those experiences at the faculty level, um, as well as some literature at the on the medical student side, but not a lot in terms of that gray zone, which we felt like was a really important part of training to understand. Uh, it's a vulnerable time where people are in some ways being in, um, kind of initiated into this new uh, specialty of their choice and, and learning a lot about professional identity and what their place is within a larger institution and a larger profession. So we wanted to understand how um, black and brown residents really felt about their experiences in residency. Um, so towards that end, we conducted some semi-structured interviews or used an interview guide, but also were free to kind of deviate and probe on themes as they were identified by um, our, our group of, of residents. Um, we interviewed people who met the AAMC criteria for underrepresented medicine, primarily African-American people. Um, and then we conducted interviews until we reached any kind of thematic saturation where we no longer felt like there were new things that were arising. Um, and then we just took a, a look at our data. We had a, a group of three, three of us on the team who um, looked at the, the subsequent interviews to really find recurrent themes that we could identify as an overarching narrative. Um, and this is a, a little bit of our, our, our interview guide. So a lot of it was fairly open-ended, just asking people to share about their experiences, um, what they feel like it, it might be to be underrepresented in medicine and to give some examples of, of how race was relevant to their experience. So we ended up publishing this study uh, back in uh, 2018, I think it was. Um, and this was a um, kind of a sense of our, our sample. So we talked to 27 residents who represented 21 different institutions. 56% uh, identified as female, 40%, 44% identified as male. The majority, as I noted, were African American, um, and then we had a good group of, of specialties represented—12 medical specialties across the folks that we talked to. Um, and for the next section here, I just want to talk a little bit about what we learned when we, we spoke with these residents. Our team ultimately boiled it down to three themes that could really um, encapsulate the, the experiences of these folks. The first was common racial bias. The second was role of race ambassador, which I'll explain. And then thirdly, the pressure to cover racial, racial identity, which we'll also go into in more detail. I think by far the, the most common theme was around bias, both implicit and explicit, but primarily implicit bias. And there are a few sub themes that kind of shed light on what that meant for these trainees. At first was what we called assumptions of lower status, whereby the black and brown residents were very frequently uh, mistaken to be any member of the team but the physician. So they were called food transport workers, um, you know, uh, medical assistants, people who are supporting the team, people who have integral roles, of course, to the whole healthcare team. Um, but despite 
attempts to really assert their identity and to wear, you know, a stethoscope around their neck, a, a badge with the MD label very prominent. It seems that patients, families, in some cases, um, other members of the care team really had a hard time seeing these black and brown residents as physicians and as leaders of the team. And you've seen that, that those quotes there, I've never been called transport so many times in my life. I've been confused for janitor, food service worker. Even when I go in a room, I introduce myself, like always when I first walk in a room, hello, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and it's like they don't hear that. So really the sense of cognitive dissonance, uh, which was very disheartening for our residents and made them feel like they, they didn't belong in the environment. Another form of implicit bias is what we termed alien in one's own land. So these were generally people from Hispanic or Latinx backgrounds um, who had names that were not common um, Anglo-Saxon names in, in the States. And so, you know, people often from patients making comments, hey, can I just call you Bob? Or saying things like, wow, that last name is different. How do I say? It? Where is that from? Is English your first language? Where are you from? Um, and this resident who is actually Mexican-American, whose family had been in the U.S. for four generations um, and was very proud of his culture, but also, you know, very much identified as an American, um, just was really sharing how they would not just accept Texas. When he says, I'm from Texas, they were always kind of following up with, with more questions and making it seem like because he had a Hispanic last name, he could not be American and, and other forms of bias like that. We also saw what we called assumptions of similarities of similarity, and this was the idea that for many of our black and brown residents, they found that they were confused for other residents of the program who are also black and brown, even if they didn't look very similar. And this quote, this is from a surgical resident who says, six of us are black women, they're constantly interchanging our names, constantly interchanging people that don't even look alike. People that it's like, I was in your surgery, I was in your eight hour surgery the other day, your eight hour surgery and you do not know my name. So again, another theme that really made folks feel like they did not belong at the institution that um, people around many cases were even sometimes, you know, the program leader, um, who the program director who was engaged, engaging in this kind of behavior to not know the names and really added to that sense of isolation. And then most commonly, there were forms of explicit bias. Um, for example, this resident who said, someone like, or who had a patient say to them, excuse me, someone like you should go back to where you came from. You people come and you take our places and you take our jobs and you don't even have citizenship and you don't even speak English. So, you know, clearly nothing, nothing implicit or unconscious about this, just hateful language. Um, and the resident described having to continue on to go through their day despite having an encounter like this, um, which was of course very challenging. We also found that despite the relative frequency of these episodes, very few residents actually did anything to share this with their program or to arc it up the chain. Um, and oftentimes they either would kind of go home and perhaps talk to a partner or a friend about what was going on or have an internal support system among um, other residents who identified as underrepresented um, and when we asked why there was no follow-up and why they didn't share that, these kinds of incidents with program leadership, a lot of it came down to these three reasons. One was fear of repercussion um, and just the fear that their institution was very hierarchical. One intern um, said, when you're at a certain level of training, you don't have to really stick out your neck and say you're totally out of line. There's also some skepticism that speaking up would actually lead to any kind of measurable change. Someone said, I brought up in the past, it was kind of pushed aside. So sort of a mindset of why bother? And then time and energy expenditure, which, which I found really moving, just this idea that residency in general requires a lot of emotional bandwidth. And so to kind of sit with the program director, director talk to someone, an ombudsman about what's going on, um, just, it just felt like an additional uh, expenditure of emotional energy as well as time. And I think the resident put it very well in this last quote, that's the hottest piece of currency that I own in residency is my time. I don't want to spend it reliving something. Our second theme was around the role of race ambassador. And some of you may be familiar with the term minority tax, um, which is, is this idea that particularly in academic settings, what can happen is that for folks who are racially underrepresented, there's an increased burden to do things like join a diversity committee, help recruit and retain certain individuals from diverse backgrounds, 
um, mentor and advise students or trainees of color. So all these sort of added tasks or, or efforts that historically haven't been compensated, that haven't come with time, uh, productive time or compensation, right? And so um, thinking about how that tax can actually downstream really affect things like promotion and, and recognition. And what we thought was interesting is that while that, that phenomenon has been well described in the literature for faculty members, we actually saw that the residents themselves were vocalizing a lot of these same themes. Um, we talked to residents who are, you know, entirely developing and running a health equity curriculum at their institution because there was no faculty member who felt comfortable with that material, who were leading diversity committees, who were felt like they had increased responsibilities to educate their peers around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So a lot of work that was being done that, again, wasn't given time or, or compensation. And one resident put it this way, the Black people are asked to, to fix the Black, black problem. Um, what we also noticed was that there was really a lack of a, a long-term plan when it came to DEI work. And in many cases, we felt that there was this institutional abdication of responsibility when it came to uh, having a strategic plan or vision for improving DEI issues. Um, and it was, made it very vulnerable because in many cases there would be one attending or one resident who was really passionate about the work and who would be doing it. But then when that person would leave, as you can see in that second quote, a black attending who was very involved in recruitment left to another institution. And since he's left without that voice on the table, there's few and everything sort of falls apart. So not, not very sustainable in terms of uh, prioritizing DEI work. And then this last theme, thirdly, is around uh, pressure to cover. And this is a term um, that was uh, conceptualized by Kenji Yoshino, who's a legal scholar. And uh, he talks about covering as this attempt to play down um, identities that are outside the mainstream in order to blend in. And we definitely found that theme with the residents that we spoke to, where they felt like, particularly when it came to external factors such as care or clothing or speech, um, there was this attempt to, to be very mindful of how they were presenting. And oftentimes that hypervigilance was related to experiences that they had. In that first quote, this is a biracial uh, resident who one parent is black and one parent is white and he wears his natural hair um, in an Afro and oftentimes pulled in a ponytail. And he had one of his clinic attendings come up to him and say, you know, there's people uh, who you're going to see in clinic who probably would not feel comfortable with your hair being like that. And, you know, he found it shocking that someone would say that to him, but didn't really know what to do about it and then ended up just kind of changing his hairstyle and not letting anyone else in the program know about this comment. Um, and the hypervigilance that resulted was often around feeling like a race representative that any action, good or bad, would, uh, would somehow cause others in the program to extrapolate that as a characteristic of the entire race. Um, and this was particularly predominant in, in low diversity environments where there were very few residents of color at the institution. Um, and one resident told us, you just want to make sure that what you're doing is top notch because they may use your mistakes and then kind of pair that uh, with your race. Um, which of course, it was not a, a comfortable feeling. Um, outside from this qualitative data, I also just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about bias and professional opportunities and advancement. Um, some of you may be familiar with this study about racial ethnic bias and Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society selection that made a big splash when it came out a few years ago, it was led up by a team here at Yale. Um, and the bottom line is that both Black and Asian students were less likely to be inducted into Alpha Omega Alpha, even after controlling for what you might think of as those common offenders that might play a role, as you can see there. Um, and this, like I said, really made waves and actually caused several medical schools to temporarily or permanently suspend um, Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society selections and to take a look at their internal process um, to understand what was driving those inequities. Uh, there's also some literature around racial, ethnic, and gender bias in medical student evaluations. So I'm sure a lot of you remember the MSPE, that large kind of um, dean's letter that, that contains a lot of language or to summarize the medical student's performance as they go on to their next step of training. Um, in terms of the racial bias, what they found is that, again, even after controlling for step one scores um, or leadership experiences, community outreach experiences and so forth, white applicants were more likely to be described with those standout keywords that reviewers are often looking for at the other, um, on the other side of the application. 
words like exceptional, best, outstanding. Um, and Black applicants were really described more in muted language. This resident was competent, for example. Um, and then the gender piece, interesting, um, not surprising, but I think um, women were more likely to be described with nurturing words like caring, empathetic, commented on their organizational skills uh, instead of using, again, those standout keywords that really tend to um, make an impact in terms of who's reviewing the application. Um, what we also know is that when we take a look at the distribution of U.S. medical faculty by race and ethnicity, um, you know, if you look at the, um, the x-axis here, we have the different groups here, white, African-American, Asian, Hispanic, Latinx, um, and then the blue stands for assistant professor, associate professors in orange, and then gray is full professor. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is that even for Asian groups who are not underrepresented in medicine, um, any racial group besides white uh, faculty members really have this same pattern where the majority of the physicians are clumped in the assistant professor category, but then that level of diversity really trails off as you move up to, to associate and full professor. Um, and there was an interesting study done about 10 years ago by Marcel Nunez-Smith looking at that variation in promotion. Um, and the bottom line was that most institutions displayed lower rates of promotion for Black and Hispanic faculty, despite controlling for um, characteristics that you might think of as germane to how that decision is made. Interestingly, there are 13% of institutions who do not promote any Hispanic faculty over the course of this study period. Almost a quarter didn't promote any Black faculty at all. Uh, but there was this third, the third of their sample size that pose somewhat equitable rates of promotion, which I think is encouraging in terms of thinking about what the best practices might be that are associated there. The next section we'll, we'll talk about is the case for why this all matters, why is this relevant to us as, as healthcare professionals. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, the case for this really comes from the business literature and um, certainly in academia as well. There was a great study in the 1990s from uh, Anne McLeod uh, around diversity and, and creativity. And there's this experiment that was done. There are 135 paid volunteers. They're all college students, I believe. And they were randomly assigned to two groups and had this brainstorming task to solve the Taurus problem. And essentially they were tasked to come up with as many ideas as possible to improve American tourism. Um, and then blinded judges uh, assess the performance based on the feasibility of the ideas and also the effectiveness. Um, and what they found is that for the groups that were made up of people from a variety of different backgrounds, they had ideas that were much more feasible and more effective um, compared to those groups that were homogenous. And this is often thought of as a landmark study to think about why diversity is important in terms of creative thought um, and giving an organization really a unique advantage. Um, from the business side of things, I think also certainly applies to our, our medical organization. Um, thinking about how diversity leads to a competitive advantage when you have a heterogeneous group, uh, better market performance, increased productivity, higher return on equity, all these things have been associated with organizations that are not made of people who have same lived experiences or the same identity group. So something that's important, um, I think, thinking about it from an organizational optimization point, in addition to, of course, the, the moral argument that I hope we, we all care about. In terms of health equity, um, you know, I think this is an important point, although it's important to be careful about it, because the message certainly shouldn't be that um, people of color should only be treated by uh, physicians who are also of color. But it is true that the literature, literature supports that race concordant care improves access. So particularly for providers who are black and brown, they often will go practice in areas where there are a higher number of underrepresented individuals who we all know unfortunately experience worse outcomes in our country. Um, so in terms of thinking about Medicaid patients, uninsured patients, patients who are high utilizers of acute health services in the ED, in, the, in urgent care centers, um, and patients who self-report a fair or poor health status um, are providers of color much more likely to work uh, with that, that group. So again, I say it with a grain of salt because I, again, don't want to send the message that our solution is to um, make sure that providers and physicians all uh, have the same, I'm sorry, providers and patients have the same race. But I do think it's important to note that diversifying our healthcare workforce is likely to make inroads in terms of this health equity issue that we, we constantly face. Um, so for the remainder here, then I hope to leave a, a good amount of time for, for questions here at the end. 
um, and thinking about how we can move forward and some of the work that I've been doing in the DEI space and um, other things to think about as, as you chew on some of what we've been talking about um, during this talk. So I think something that's become very clear to me in the time that I've been uh, doing this work is how important it is to uh, protect time for DEI leadership efforts. As you saw in the, the data that I showed, it unfortunately has become way too common for folks to think of DEI leadership as an extracurricular activity that, that doesn't get much recognition or much support. Um, and I think there's really something about uh, giving that protected time and that funding to make sure that the message is being sent that DEI is something that's prioritized in a department, in a larger institution, um, whatever the, the sphere of influence might be. And I feel really uh, fortunate that I have had time and support uh, to do the work that I do. So uh, as Sam mentioned at the beginning, I have a few roles in DEI leadership. One is as the Associate Program Director for DEI in Yale Primary Care, um, and then the Vice Chief for DEI in the Section of General Medicine. Um, and then, as, as most of you probably know, Ahini Hanau left us this spring to become the, the Dean of Diversity, Equity, um, and Belonging at Penn State. This is such a wonderful opportunity for her. And um, in, in that transition, I'm now helping with the DEI Vice Chief Development across uh, different sections um, and partnering with Vandana Kungar, who's taking on um, other of Ahini's responsibilities on an, in, on an interim basis. Um, and I made this a sort of a Venn diagram because I, I just want to note that I think it's so important for diversity and equity and inclusion work that it doesn't happen in silos. And I think there are many ways in which all of these roles help to inform each other. Um, you know, certainly both the APD role and the vice chief in GIM role uh, are under the larger GIM section, right? And so um, our trainees are a very integral part of how we function overall as a section of general medicine um, and doing the work in terms of thinking about how we uh, help develop our, our DI vice chief across the department of medicine um, is also going to have downstream effects in terms of what's happening in the individual sections. Um, in terms of thinking about the DI vice chief development, I think we've really had this kind of tripart vision and um, I think Anhania did such a wonderful job in terms of developing infrastructure for DEI uh, uh, administration because a few years ago, and certainly, you know, I came to residency here, so I've been here for about nine years. And when I first came, there really wasn't much in the way of leadership positions or people who were really taking their time and energy to work on various DEI initiatives. And so even having a DI vice chief in each section in the Department of Medicine is just such a wonderful development and I'm really so grateful to have the support of the department in that. I think in terms of the things that we've been focusing on, team building has been a huge component of the work that we're trying to do um, because I think it's been very clear that there's been a little bit of DEI work done in you know, one section perhaps, but then no one else in the department may know about it. And there may be multiple people who are working towards the same goal but uh, even reinventing the wheel because it's, it's unclear uh, who's doing what. And so, you know, part of it is developing a really good team model so that we can support one another um, and collaborate and make sure that we're, we're really effective in the work that we're doing. Secondly is the goal of DI knowledge and skill building. I think there's a ton of passion in our group for social justice and it's such a wonderful group uh, to be part of. And so a lot of what we're thinking about now is how do we just hone our skills to make us more effective as DEI leaders and understand the strengths that people are bringing to enhance the content um, that we can, can then bring back to our individual sections. Um, and then a, a huge piece as well has been leadership development. And I'm really grateful to be partnering with Doug McKinley, who's a, an out external consultant who comes in and works with us to help us understand our leadership styles, to understand how to be more effective in the work that we do, um, and to really kind of harness our, our individual personalities uh, to make sure that we are um, going into this work to really make sure that we are thinking of ourselves as just as worthy as other vice chiefs in a section and getting that kind of voice to, to make us effective leaders. So it's, it's been fun to have him work alongside um, as, as we're sort of doing the DI content piece to also think about how do I understand myself as a leader and what does that mean in terms of how I want to optimize the work that I'm doing. Um, and then in terms of vice chief role as the section of general medicine specifically, um, this is a year, I, a role I've had for uh, about a year now. And so really the focus that I've been having in this first year plus has been around education. 
um, and doing a lot of uh, faculty development. Something that I'm really excited about that our, our section has uh, committed to is having an annual DEI themed retreat, um, which we had uh, in February, which was our first one since the pandemic. So it was virtual, but at least we were able to, to go through the content. And we did things like have a virtual privilege walk, um, talk about what, what privilege means um, in terms of what it looks like for our lived experiences, doing some small group activities and um, having an external speaker come in um, and talk about resistance and advocacy. Um, so really great ways to keep the conversation going. I think sometimes in DEI, it can feel like a you know one-off kind of thing where, oh, someone has a training, um, but we don't want it to be a checklisty kind of initiative. We really want to think about how to create it to be a thread and a recurring theme that comes into people's minds. Um, I've also enjoyed being the director of the Race, Science, and Advocacy and Medicine Distinction Pathway and working alongside a great group of faculty and resident co-leads um, and these are for residents in any of our three internal medicine programs. So the traditional internal medicine program, the primary care program that I work primarily in, and then the medicine pediatrics program. So it's open to all, all residents in any of those three tracks. And the idea is for it to be a deeper dive into some of these social justice kinds of issues um, for people who want to engage more. So they attend various forms of interactive didactics in order to, at the end of their tenure as a resident, they kind of graduate with distinction in this particular uh, field. And it's similar to the way that we think about distinction pathways in other aspects. Um, so we have uh, investigations pathway, we have a clinical educator pathway, um, we have a global health and equity pathway. So really great as the most recent of these distinction pathways to really elevate the importance of thinking about things along the lines of race and bias. Um, a large piece of that too is thinking about how we can provide mentorship and professional develop opportunities for, for these residents because a fair number of them are, are underrepresented in medicine themselves. Um, looking forward, I think something I would love to focus on in the vice chief role in the next year or two is thinking about recruitment and retention. I think we've certainly made some inroads in terms of diversifying our trainees, still a ton of work to do there. Um, but you know, the, the faculty level, uh, as I showed you in some earlier data, tends to be a really, um, a really challenging um, uh, kind of trend to shift. And so, you know, thinking about what it looks like to, to make sure that we're positioning ourselves in a position to diversify our faculty um, and even to think about the experiences of, of those who are underrepresented in medicine to make sure that we're addressing any potential barriers. Um, and then as APD for uh, DEI and the Yale Primary Care Residency, I have a number of roles, some of which are traditional uh, APD roles administratively, but also in education recruitment, um, thinking about climate. Um, I have a curriculum with the residents that run three years in our ambulatory didactic curriculum, where we dive into a lot of different interactive small group activities to help them understand the experiences of other people in the training program who may or may or not look like them. And we always have incredibly rich conversations to think about our own identities and what that means, not only personally, but professionally, what that means when we interact with patients. So that's always a really fun thing uh, to work on. Um, I'm grateful that we've, we've done quite well when it comes to recruiting a diverse uh, group of residents in our primary care program. Um, and that's been a really integral part of our, our ethos as a program that's something that we very much prioritize. Um, of course, it's not just recruitment, it's also the retention and making sure that the climate that these trainees are in one is one that actually encourages other folks to come and feel at home here and experience that sense of belonging. Um, and I, I really enjoy that mentoring and advising piece um, and that helping to advocate for people to, to make sure that they do feel like they belong. Um, so as I wrap up here in the next few minutes, um, just thinking about institutional next steps, you know, I think I always like to emphasize that each of us, whatever our particular roles might be, there's something that we can do as a, as a next step in terms of um, adding our voice to this long-term uh, road to equity and to justice. And I think something that's very clear to me is that institutions and sections and departments, we all have to take ownership of diversity. You know, it can't be this thing where it's um, relegated to only people who have official DEI positions because diversity, as we talked about, is something that really benefits everyone. It's not just for underrepresented groups. And so everyone has to um, be a part of the, the, the effort to really make sure that we're uh, meeting the challenges and improving ourselves um, consistently. I think in a lot of the ways that we talk about an institutional standard of excellence in, in many things like patient 
safety and quality, we really need to have a, diff, a, a similar mindset, a similar framework when it comes to DEI. I also think that some of that racial burden that we talked about um, where there's that, uh, that tax to underrepresented individuals can be minimized if there's more resources and support to diversity initiatives and making sure that people who may not feel like they themselves have personally been um, the recipients or bias for microaggressions, they also of course have a very important role to play in all of this too. As an organization, I think um, some of the things that come to mind is the importance of mandatory unconscious bias training. Paris Lawrence, uh, who recently came to speak with our vice chief, DEI vice chief group, is the inaugural director of DEI training and development underneath uh, Darren Lattimore um, in Darren Lattimore's Office of um, Diversity and Inclusion at the med school. I think that's going to be really great. It's not mandatory yet, um, but I do think sometimes in these DEI circles, we kind of get to the this concept of preaching to the choir and people who show up and engage in the topic are people who are already bought in. Um, so thinking about what it looks like to implement structures so that everyone can, can engage in these issues and ultimately help to cultivate our environment. I think open forums to discuss these topics are really important. Sometimes with our residents, we'll do town halls where we just have people reflect on what's going on in the world, things that have happened in their own lives. Um, because as was clear to me in the, the study we did with those residents, oftentimes there aren't adequate venues for people to process their feelings and their experiences. I also think it's incredibly important to survey our trainees about their experiences because oftentimes they're not coming forward unless being asked. Um, and so I think that needs to become a regular part of our culture. We talked about a strategic plan to increase diversity. I think that's part of hiring those roles so people can build out those plans mentorship of underrepresented groups, um, not only a faculty who look like them, but people who can be really um, informative allies and support folks well to achieve their personal best. Um, and then making sure, as I mentioned, that we support colleagues who do engage in diversity work um, and do it in a way that's not gonna um, be a detriment to their career advancement. On an individual level, I think there are a number of practices that we can also engage in. I think. Um, having awareness of our personal biases is, is something that's extremely important. I mentioned implicit, the implicit association test earlier, which I'm sure some of you have, have done in the past. I think it's, a, it's not a perfect test, but it's a good way to think about some of that unconscious bias that might be lurking underneath the service. Um, and I think that awareness is a really important first step in then helping to make sure that we're um, changing our behavior. When it comes to evaluations, this is something I hear a lot um, from the tra trainees who come and talk to me and debrief is, is not always feeling like the, um, the feedback they get is, um, is as fair and equitable as it could be and wondering, you know, if they do something or say something, is it perceived in the same way um, as another trainee who does the same thing, who, who looks differently from them and is part of the majority. Um, and because of the data that we, we do know that shows those, those differences in how we're evaluating trainees, I think it's really important when we are on the side of evaluating someone else to be clear about what the performance metrics are, to be really specific in terms of behavior-based language um, and, and not just say things like, oh, this person was a good fit or, you know, this person did a good job. Like, wh why, are we, why are we saying someone does well or doesn't do well? Mindfulness is an interesting point. I actually read a study about how mindfulness can help to disrupt some of the fast brain connections that we, that we make. Um, and so engaging in mindfulness can um, in some ways help to attenuate that implicit bias, which is really important in the complex cognitive environment that we all live and work in. Um, and then thinking about how you can share the diversity work in your department. I know from Pam that there's some great things that are, that are happening already. Um, and maybe if, if you've been on the sidelines and don't feel like the expert in the room, there's probably still something that you can contribute. And, doing that, having that effort of increasing your personal growth and stepping out of your comfort zone and joining in the work um, can only yield good things. So last thought here, you know, I really think a lot of the, what I talked about today is ultimately a wellness issue. I think representation and experience are, are very much interdependent, you know, for making all these efforts to recruit and retain people, but we're not um, doing the, the work that we need to do to create a kind of climate where people feel welcome. Um, then of course it, it's not going to be successful. So we really need to think about those efforts as very much linked. I'd also encourage you before we get to questions here, just to take a moment of silent reflection. 
and think about how you can do something differently moving forward. Um, you know, maybe it's a simple step like a book you want to read or a colleague you want to talk to about their experience joining a diversity committee, you know, doing something different. Um, so I think there's constantly something to do in this larger journey towards uh, justice. Um, and we, we all can make those decisions to, to move forward. A few resources that I'll leave you with, um, some books that I've read that I think are give a nice lens to thinking about some of these issues. Um, the AAMC, that second bullet there, has a great portal on physician workforce data. So if you're interested in some of those trends or wanted to look up um, how the healthcare profession is doing in terms of diversity or inclusion efforts, there's some really great resources there as well. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, I thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Ava, thank you so much. That was um, wonderful to hear a little bit more about your research and some action items that I think we can all take. So what I thought I would do is um, turn, there's actually a great first question we can take from the chat. Um, so this is, um, the question is, what is the approach to addressing patients' bias and aggression? It seems we have strong efforts in place in regards to faculty development, but how to approach patients? It's difficult to speak back to patients. And that's a great question. And in fact, I'll just editorialize a little bit. I, I have personally found and observed that we've seen more patient bad behavior in the era of COVID. And um, I think it's it's a struggle. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, this is such an important question. And it's, um, it's something that I, I love to, to talk to people about as well. Um, because, you know, some of you might be familiar with the term of bystander response training, or more recently, we call it upstander response training, because we want to make it more proactive. But there is really such an important role when it is the patient um, who is saying something inappropriate. And I've had, you know, in our program, there's a graduate of our, our Yale primary care program who was actually called the N-word on our inpatient general medical service by a patient. And literally no one in the room said anything, even though there were about five or six other healthcare professionals in the room at the time. Um, so I think this is critical in terms of, you know, can really make or break anyone's experience. But of course, our trainees are, are more vulnerable. I think, um, my personal feeling on this is that it's very important to be direct with patients. I think you can be both direct and respectful. Oftentimes what I'll do is I'll employ strategies that encourage the person who made a comment to reflect. Um, so I'll say something, for example, you know, what did you mean by that? Or what made you say that? Um, and I think that signals that what was said is not okay and put that person in a position of um, explaining why they made a, made a comment. Um, I think ideally, you know, it can lead to a teachable moment. Sometimes, um, you know, you can have a strategy where you acknowledge that the person may not have had bad intent, but there's still a bad impact. And so, you know, I may, I know you may not have meant harm or you may not have realized that your words were offensive, but that was actually really hurtful to me or really bothersome to me. And here's why I'm in hoping to engage. Um, there are many other strategies, but I'll leave it at that. I think um, sometimes if a, if a patient is particularly antagonistic, something I'll do if they don't seem open to education is just remind them of our sort of institutional values. Um, saying something like an institution like Yale is very important. We all embody this, these ideas of respect and accountability and compassion. Our team is treating you that way. We very much expect those same kinds of values in return. So please respect every member of our team um, and then transition to talking about, you know, the blood pressure or, or whatever the situation might be. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd love to turn to Dr. Barbara Burtness, who's serving as our um, interim associate director for DEI for the Cancer Center. So Barbara and I partner in a lot of these efforts. So Barbara, any comments or questions? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you for, for coming and, and sharing with us um, and for the work that you do. Um, what I particularly loved um, was, uh, you, you know, your, your message that implicit bias the, it, is not cast in stone, that, that this is something that over time you can see progress on. Um, you know, obviously you brought forward a, um, an example with college students in the same way it gets harder to learn a new language when you get older, it's probably harder to let go of, of um, these habits that, that people have had over the years. Um, but I wanted to, and, and I loved um, your emphasis on repeated exposure to counter-stereotypic examples. Um, 
and obviously representation is, is part of that. Um, you know, um, the, the fact that, that we're able to use Cancer Center Grand Rounds on, on DEI topics, I think is, is one of the reasons we, we like to do this. But I, I guess I, as much as I like that, I, I still see it as very difficult. And, um, you know, I, I struggle with issues like, to what extent can you require um, people to do implicit bias training? What's the, the backlash and the resentment that that creates? And, um, you know, I just took a quick look at who the attendees are for, for today's um, Grand Rounds, and it, it's a lot of people who already work on, on these issues. So, um, Apart from working on our artwork, working on who we invite as speakers, do you have any concrete strategies for, for kind of breaking across to, to groups where these biases are, are, are more solidified, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's, I complete, that completely resonates with me because it's tough. And I, you know, as many of these workshops and so forth that I do, oftentimes the people in the audience are people who are already very much bought in. And so we have the same, you know, problem in general medicine. Um, I think there are a few things, right? I think um, even though it, it can be a little uncomfortable to mandate training, I, I do think, you know, there is precedent for it. You know, we all have to undergo sexual harassment training. We all have to go, you know, go through training on, you know, how to um, decrease certain infections in the hospital and, and know the response to a, a code and, you know, all those kinds of things that we're required to do. So I, I do think there's a way in which the, the trainings that we decide are mandatory for any employee can send a message about what we think is really important. Um, that aside, um, you know, I think this like larger question of how do you engage individuals who, who, who may not be particularly excited about diversity, equity, and inclusion um, one strategy that I often use with the residents is trying to engage in as many small group activities as possible, because I find that for people who may be a little bit resistant to the topic, um, it's a lot easier for them to learn if they hear their peer talk about something that happened to them personally, because they care about their peer, right? Um, and so oftentimes in my the curriculum that I mentioned that I do with the Yale primary care residents, very little of it is didactic. You know, I'm not here, I don't deliver grand rounds to the residents, I'm not talking for an hour. What I'm doing is I'm creating structured opportunities for them to reflect and then share. Um, so for example, you know, we'll do an activity where we write down our name on a piece of paper and then we think about uh, seven identities that mean something to us. It can be race, gender, ability, religion, whatever, defined as for an individual. And I just ask two simple questions. One is, um, describe you know, a time that you were proud to be part of one of these identities and describe a time that it was painful for you to be part of these identities. And I'm always amazed by the richness of the conversation that comes from such a simple activity. Um, and I've witnessed like people sort of light bulbs go off when you know someone, for example, shares uh, a painful time when they were a member of a certain community and what that means and what you know the things that they have to think about. It just creates an opportunity for someone to be in someone else's shoes. And I think that's a, a more accessible way to uh, engage in DEI issues um, for someone who you know is not going to attend the grand rounds or something on the topic. Great, Ava. Thank you. We are at time, so I, we could go on probably for a while longer with questions. But um, I'm certainly leaving feeling inspired, motivated, and really hopeful about this work that can be hard and slow going. Um, so thank you for sharing kind of your vision um, with us. And um, I'm, I'm sure I, I certainly learned a lot and I'm sure our audience did too. So thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank, thank you, you so much, much for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.